Can you maybe elaborate how the principle of computational equivalence can save a planet? That would that would be a, I have a, a terrible spoiler for. Hey, that would be a spoiler. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but but no, but I, I, let me say what the principle of computational equivalence is. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, you are you have a system, you have some rule, you can think of its behavior as corresponding to a computation. The question is, how sophisticated is that computation? Mm -hmm. The statement of the principle of computational equivalence is: as soon as it's it's not obviously simple it will be as sophisticated as anything. Mm -hmm. And so that has the implication that, you know, rule 30, uh, you know, our brains, other things in physics, they're all ultimately equivalent in the computations they can do. And that's what leads to this computational irreducibility idea because the reason we don't get to jump ahead, you know, and, and outthink rule 30 mm -hmm. is because we're just computationally equivalent to rule 30. So we're kind of just both just running computations that are the same sort of raw, the same level of computation, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the the idea there. And the question, I mean, it's it's like uh, the you know in in the the science fiction version would be okay. Somebody says we just need more servers. Get us more servers. The way to get even more servers is turn the whole planet into a bunch of micro servers. Mm -hmm. And that that's uh, that's where it starts. And so the question of you know computational equivalence, principle of computational equivalence, is well, actually, you don't need to build those custom servers. Actually, you can uh, you can just um, use natural computation to compute things, so to speak. You can use nature to compute. You don't need to have done all that engineering. I mean, it's kind of the it's it's kind of feels a little disappointing that you say we're going to build all these servers, we're going to do all these things, we're going to make you know maybe we're going to have human consciousness uploaded into you know some elaborate digital environment, and then you look at that thing and you say it's got electrons moving around just like in a rock, mm -hmm. and then you say well what's the difference? And the principle of computational equivalence says there isn't at some level a fundamental you know you can't say mathematically. There's a fundamental difference between the rock that is the future of human consciousness and the rock that's just a rock. Mm -hmm. Now, what I've sort of realized with this kind of consciousness thing is there is a uh, there is an aspect of this that seems to be more special mm -hmm. that isn't. And, and for example, something I, I haven't really teased apart properly is when it comes to something like the weather and the weather having a mind of its own or whatever, or your average you know, pulsar magnetosphere acting like a sort of intelligent thing, how does that relate to, you know, how, how, do, how is that, that entity related to the kind of consciousness that we have? And sort of what would the world look like you know, to the weather? If we think about the weather as a mind, what will it perceive? What will it laws, its laws of physics be? I don't really know. Because um, it's very parallel. It's very parallel, among other things, and it it it's not obvious. I mean, this is a a, a really kind of mind bending thing because we've got to try and imagine where, uh, you know, we've got to try and imagine a parsing of the universe different from the one we have. And by the way, when we think about extraterrestrial intelligence and so on, I think that's kind of the key thing. Is you know, we've always assumed. I've always assumed. Okay, the extraterrestrials, at least they have the same physics. We all live in the same universe. They've got the same physics. But actually, that's not really right because the extraterrestrials could have a completely different way of parsing that the universe. So it's as if, you know, there could be, for all we know, right here in this room, you know, in the in the details of the motion of these gas molecules, mm -hmm. there could be an amazing intelligence that we were like, but we have no way of, we're not parsing the universe in the same way. If only we could parse the universe in the right way, you know, immediately this amazing thing that's going on and this, you know, huge culture that's developed and all that kind of thing would be obvious to us, but it's not because we have our particular way of parsing the universe. Would that thing also have a s agency? I don't know the right word to use, but something like consciousness, but a different kind of consciousness? I think it's a question of just what you mean by the word, because I think that the, you know, this notion of consciousness and the, okay, so some people think of consciousness as sort of a key aspect of it is that we feel that the, the, the sort of a feeling of that we exist in some way, that we have this yeah. intrinsic feeling about ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I suspect that any of these things would also have an intrinsic feeling about themselves. I've been sort of trying to think recently about constructing an experiment about what if you were just a piece of a cellular automaton, let's say, mm -hmm. 
you know, what would your feeling about yourself actually be? And, you know, can we put ourselves in the in the shoes, in the cells of the cellular automaton, so to speak? Can we can we get ourselves close enough to that that we could have a sense of what the world would be like if you were operating in that way? And it's a little difficult because, you know, you have to not only think about what are you perceiving, but also what's actually going on in your brain. Mm -hmm. And our brains do what they actually do. And they don't, it's, uh, you know, I think there might be some experiments that are possible with, with uh, you know, neural nets and so on, where you can have something where you can at least see in detail what's happening inside the system. And I, I've been sort of one of the, one of my projects to think about is, is there a way of kind of, uh, uh, kind of getting a sense kind of from inside the system about what its view of the world is and, and how it, how it, you know, uh, can, can we make a bridge? See, see, the main issue is this, where, where you know, it's a it's a sort of philosophically difficult thing because mm -hmm. it's like we do what we do. We understand ourselves, um, at least to some extent. We really. humans understand ourselves. That's okay. correct. And but yet, okay. So what are we trying to do? For example, when we are trying to make a model of physics, what are we actually trying to do? Because you know, you say, well, can we work out what the universe does? Well, of course we can. We just watch the universe. The universe does what it does. Mm -hmm. But what we're trying to do when we make a model of physics is we're trying to get to the point where we can tell a story to ourselves that we understand that is also a representation of what the universe does. Yeah. So it's this kind of, you know, can we make a bridge between what we humans can understand in our minds and what the universe does? Mm -hmm. And in a sense, you know, a large part of my kind of life uh, efforts have been devoted to making computational language, which kind of is a bridge between what is possible in the computational universe and what we humans can conceptualize and think about. In a sense, what, you know, when I built Wolfram Language and our whole sort of computational language story, it's all about how do you take sort of raw computation and this ocean of computational possibility, and how do we sort of represent pieces of it in a way that we humans can understand and that map onto things that we care about doing. And in a sense, when you add physics, you're adding this other piece where we can, you know, mediated by a computer, can we get physics to the point where we humans can understand something about what's happening in it? Mm -hmm. And when we talk about an alien intelligence, it's kind of the same story. It's like, is there a way of mapping what's happening there onto something that we humans can understand? And, you know, physics in some sense is like our exhibit one of the story of alien intelligence. It's, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, you know, it's an alien intelligence in some sense. And what we're doing in making a model of physics is mapping that onto something that we understand. And I think, you know, a lot of these other things that have I've recently been kind of studying, uh, whether it's molecular biology, other kinds of things, um, which we can talk about a bit, mm -hmm. um, the, um, uh, those are other cases where we're in a sense trying to again make that bridge between what we humans understand and sort of the the natural language of that sort of alien intelligence in some sense. Yeah.